Bojo Ani. Bojo, Annie, bienvenue, welcome. Welcome to Massey College. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers, and I am the principal of Massey College. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to a very special event where we celebrate, partially, the great intellectual legacy of Principal Emeritus Hugh Siegel. I first want to acknowledge that Massey College is built on indigenous lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Anoshone, and it is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this land and the great privilege that we all have to be here together uh, to celebrate this occasion. Hugh Siegel was a great principal of Massey College. He uh, infused with uh, new ideas. He reformed the governance. He certainly solidified the partnership with the Mississaugas of the Credit. He engaged uh, Tom Axworthy to be a policy chair. Uh, and to my mind, he embodied all the values of Massey College. The interdisciplinarity, intellectual curiosity, intergenerational exchanges, inclusion. And he really is, I think, uh, someone that inspired me. I was to say uh, he was a great supportive uh, predecessor who helped me a lot navigate uh, uh, the waters of Massey when I arrived. So I just want to say, you know, Massey's motto is dare to be wise, and I think Hugh Siegel dared to be wise. So it's my great pleasure to thank uh, uh, Tom Axworthy, Tina Parks, and Arun Siddiqui for uh, creating this program, for wanting to celebrate uh, Hugh's intellectual legacy. I am very indebted to them. Without further ado, the Chair of Public Policy at Massey College, Tom Axworthy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. Uh, those of you who have been able to survive Toronto's traffic to get here on time, uh, get special accolades. We still have uh, a few guests who are still to arrive, but we're going to uh, start now. So. Uh, I have a very pleasant duty of, uh, of introducing uh, the chair of the uh, keynote uh, address, uh, Charles uh, McMillan. But before I do that, I just wanted to say, as the principal has just said, that uh, Hugh Siegel uh, was not only a major intellectual figure in our uh, society, political strategist supreme, a wit, um, but for probably most of this audience, a very good friend. And uh, I first began spending a lot of time with Hugh Siegel in the Constitutional Wars of the 70s and 80s when we would meet in Mama Teresa's restaurant and you know, over innumerable bowls of cannelloni, uh, trying to figure out how we uh, could uh, persuade those recalcitrant provinces to come on board. Uh, and uh, formed a fast friendship then. Uh, so much so that some years later when Charles Bronfman uh, did a surprise Heritage Minute on one of my days, he asked Hugh Siegel to play me. So, <laughs> which was a high point in both of our lives, actually. <laughs> but now I want to begin the proceedings. Uh, Charles McMillan, is a distinguished professor of the Schulich School of Business. I think the author of somewhat like odd books. Uh, his last, The Age of Consequence, we uh, launched at Massey College uh, uh, just a few uh, months ago. Former senior advisor to Prime Minister uh, Mulroney, a great friend of uh, Massey, and a great advocate of good public policy, Charles McMillan. Thank you. 
great to be back at Massey College. Uh, I remember upstairs during the free trade debates, debating um, several uh, U of T and New York faculty uh, on the merits of free trade. Um, don't think I won many votes, um, but you know the results of the uh, 1988 election. Um, I'm particularly happy to be here today to not only to introduce uh, uh, Jean Charest, but to pay my respects um, to the Siegel family and, as Tom noted, the friendship of Hugh Siegel. He was a person who was interested in policy, um, both public and private policy, uh, corporate uh, volunteer uh, issues, and um, he brought a uh, sense of um, participation to all he met. And he loved being um, here at Massey College, particularly to meet young students. And uh, he became a mentor for many people. Turns out I was up early today. Um, and uh, after morning prayers, I decided I should call the Vatican um, to get an update on various activities in the pearly gates. The good news is that the Vatican switchboard, not too busy today, put me directly through to St. Peter who seemed a bit distracted. I asked him why. He said that as a good Catholic, I should know that residents in heaven are entitled to a wish from the Almighty, but after only a year of stay. He mentioned that we have this new citizen, a Canadian, by the name of Hugh Siegel. He seemed to have taken charge, including organizing a weekly dinner with all things, with a range of personalities, John Diefenbaker, Pierre Trudeau, Eddie Goodman, Dalton Camp, Don Mazankowski, Bill Davis, Bob Stanfield, Norm Atkins, and even a few members of the press like uh, Bernard Durham and David Halton. I said, so what's the problem? It seems that he didn't realize you have to be here for a year before you can ask for favors. But he used his contacts to get a meeting with the Almighty, and it'd be hard to get, turn him down. I said, what's his wish list? What's he want? Is it money? No. He said, what he wants is a carpet. It has to be big, it has to be colored, and it has to be blue. Why, I asked. He said, he wants a blue carpet to welcome red Tories to the pearly gates. <laughs> that would take a miracle. So it's great pleasure I introduce a friend of Huey Siegel a friend of a lot of people in this audience and to the University and Scientific Community across Canada, Jean Charest. Like you, Siegel, Jean Charest embodies a conservative mindset. He knows that public policy is a complicated issue, it requires great flexibility and the need to work with people you may not always agree with. Jean and I have been friends for years, and I know from his political allies and his political rivals, that John embodies, like you, Siegel, a scarce feature in the political arena, a strong measure of magnanimity. His career in Ottawa and as the 29th Premier of Quebec and his legal work with an international law firm shows a wide range of policy issues that he's been involved in. For me, three stand out. Announced in Charlottetown, he, he set up the Council of the Federation, where Canada's provincial and territorial governments can work together on a range of issues and design forward-looking policies in the areas of their jurisdiction. With Roy McLaren, who's High Commissioner in London, the Trade Minister in the Jean Chrétien government, Jean Charest was the principal activist in promoting the Canada-Europe free trade deal, bringing leaders from 28 different countries to agree on a free trade deal with Canada. And for, from his prime ministerial appointment as Minister of Youth and Sport in the Maroonie government, he understood the issues involving young people, both in the environment, climate change, as well as sports and athletics as a tool for preventive health measures. When he became Minister of the Environment, he was in his own and played a reeling role on the Canadian stage with joint programs in the United States and internationally starting with the Rio summit in Brazil. As a strong federalist 
and well-versed in constitutions, he brought leadership, bold ideas, and close working relationships with the premiers, including with the Premier of Ontario. A truly bold opportunity he pushed as Premier of Quebec was a plan Nord to develop the Northern Territory of the province with other provinces across Canada and with Canada, including the Arctic. In three, these perilous times with high geopolitical tensions, it is very fitting and appropriate that Jean Charest is a guest speaker to honor Hugh Siegel at this Massey event and to give his thoughts on timely topic, a conservative philosophy in a time of growing autocracies and threats to the democratic system. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply honored to invite Jean, Carre Jean Charest to the podium. Thank you very much, uh, Charles. You may have noticed that he almost slipped into saying Jean Chrétien twice, <laughs> which is an extraordinary compliment to Jean Chrétien. <laughs> Charles, thank you for your very generous uh, introduction. And I, I have very fond memories of looking up to you when I was a young MP in Ottawa just arriving as, uh, as someone who played a significant policy role in the government of Mr. Mulroney at the time. I'm, uh, I am very honored uh, to be here today and to lend my voice to try to describe for you, with, and I have no pretense of, of having uh, an exhaustive knowledge, but I'd lend my voice to conservatism and description of the conservatism of Hugh Siegel. I first want to offer my condolences to his wife Donna and his partner, extraordinary partner, and his daughter Jacqueline, uh, also his brothers Seymour and Brian, Brian who I got to work with also uh, over the, uh, when I was Minister of, uh, of Youth. And, uh, and before I get on with the, the task that I've been given, I also, I do want to acknowledge uh, our past Governor General, Her Excellency Adrian Clarkson, who's with us today. And also, uh, soon to be unemployed Lieutenant Governor <laughs> of Ontario, who I had the privilege of working when I was Minister of the Environment. And uh, Elizabeth Doswell was responsible, Her Excellency, for the weather services at the time. And Charlie you referred very kindly to the Rio summit in that episode. And she played a key role in, uh, in Canada's position at the time. So it's a real delight for me to see you here today. And I also want to thank Axworthy and Tina Park and Arun Siddiqui for organizing this event and, uh, and inviting me. Now, I want to say how impressed I was by all the descriptions of Hugh Siegel following his, uh, his passing on the 9th of August. And in no particular order, we, it was described as a great storyteller, the quintessential public man as a, a tribal Tory, but in the very noble sense of the word. Also as a happy warrior a title that stuck to him through his, throughout his life. He was also described as one of the great public figures of his generation. He was described, obviously, as a great Canadian. But the best title I saw was a title in the Globe and Mail in 2011, a critique by Andrew Cohen of the book that he had written that's going to inspire my remarks today, uh, titled The Right Balance. And the title of that story in the Globe and Mail was The Immortal Tory. And how could it be otherwise that almost a, bit, a little over a month after his passing, here we are at Massey College to celebrate a person who for many of us will forever be the immortal Tory. He was in no particular order to say I wanted described, but there was one first order of description of who he was, the husband and partner of Donna and the father of Jacqueline. And if you didn't know that, he would remind you of that at every opportunity. 
Now, he's been described since as an advisor, an apparatchik, an academic columnist, a candidate, a chief of staff, a partisan, a pundit, an author, a mentor. But as was said previously, the title that most of us treasure was that of a friend, a friend to many of us. For five decades, he helped shape Canada's political discourse, different forms, and different roles on all the key issues that the country was confronted with. And for most of the key moments in the life of Hugh Siegel, he was at that table, and not, if not, not too far away. He loved the world of ideas, to which he would also associate something very significant, engagement. Ideas without I, engagement are ideas. Engagement is what brings about change. And he accepted engagement with all the risks inherent to it, including the victories and sometimes the losses of political life. And that is what made his life particularly significant. Engagement based on his deep belief in the virtues of Canadian conservatism. And on this subject, he wrote a book, he dedicated a book in 2011, entitled The Right Balance, Canada's Conservative Tradition. Remarks today are going to be based in good part on that book. The Canadian conservative idea started in use recount of this long before Canada was formalized as a country. Toryism is the story of how Canadian geography, demographics, climate, communities, and generations shaped a unique brand of conservatism, one that isn't replicated anywhere else in the wor world. <clears throat> Canadian conservatism, he would insist, is not a derivative of either American, British, or European forms of conservatism. Our Canadian conservative tradition may not be exportable to other societies, but the institutions it has helped shape certainly were. Federalism, our judicial system, the rule of law, parliamentary democracy. In essence, federalisms he would say, would address the different ethnic, linguistic, or geographic populations, and this was a way to maintain important local authority and jurisdiction on things that really matter. Conservatives, in his view, would always be concerned of a worldview that negates or misunderstands the force of history and leads to the kind of self-reverence that of any generation would be paralyzed with. This assessment of you, Siegel, in 2011, comes back to haunt us today. Think of the conflict in, Euro in Europe, in Ukraine, and how the forces of history come back to haunt us if we choose to ignore them. I see in the room today two individuals who were at one time Canada's ministers of defense and who would understand how significant that would be. Real conservatism is the triumph of perspective over myopia, of balance over enthusiasm. And he'd point to American democracy that had revolted against the crown, but Canadian democracy had chosen and had instead evolved with the crown. In early pre-Confederation days of Canada's emergence, Tory nationalism became the very clear and well-defined. In essence, it would be about balance, which is in the title of the book, the idea and the concept that a society is constantly challenged by trying to bring itself into balance, whether in its federal structure or the role between the public sector and the private sector. And for this, you had a very real view. It's about balance, and the Tory balance can be described simply and directly as a political system of beliefs in which fairness and compassionate are, in fact, the very foundations of society.
Confederation was and is a structural roadmap to the central compromise and vision of the Canadian conservative idea, which he described as unity under the crown, common and similar institutions in each province and Ottawa, accommodation and respect for particularity, and no overpowering in positions of federal restrictions on provincial powers or centralized federal jurisdiction. You address the issue of accommodation. And to do that, he chose to reach back into history and to a very seminal, significant moment in the formation of Canada, and that's the Act of Quebec of 1774 that very few people recognize as being at the very core of the foundation of Canada. He returns to this in the Les Bleus du Québec, et la tradition des Bleus du Québec, as being part of the central identity that has been entrenched since then. A central identity at the time based on faith, was, for all intents and purposes, synonymous in Quebec to language and the French language, la religion catholique, and the recognition in the act of Quebec of the French Catholic faith, also on language and the concept of nation. He also looked at federalism in this way. He also, through the Quebec Act, saw the first territorial, cultural, religious recognition of an official acceptance of and a distinct French language, culture, civilization that became the foundation of conservatism and nationalist conservatism. Despite wars, raids, massacres, conservative settlers' societies were ab also about accommodation and certain measure of joint enterprise. And he saw this as a core strand of Canadian conservatism. The strong Tory bias regarding respect for Quebec particularity, specificity, within Canada also informs from his perspective our conservative anxiety about a too centralized state where the divisions between federal and provincial powers are blurred by overly aggressive federal spending or taxation or legislation that could be outside federal duties as defined by 91 and 92 of the Constitution. So you reaches all the way back to that moment, to that acceptance, to that difference, and projects himself into the future on how federalism and conservatism informs the formation and the decision making in the country. The Canadian conservatism of accommodation of dealing respectfully with what people believed in and cared about and the institutions that protected those beliefs led naturally to a constitutional process structured around the remarkably more conservative notion of peace, order, and good government. On the Crown, it's been said that if the Liberals view themselves as the party of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, that most American of Canadians constitutional, that's the most American of Canadian constitutional innovations, n'est-ce pas, Tom? Conservatives see themselves as the party of the British North America Act. This act is to clear institutional order of the architecture of our statehood around the centrality of the Crown. From the beginning of the post-revolutionary colonial evolution of British North America, the stability of the crown and the balanced institutional and constitutional guarantees it offered began to define those, that conservatism mainstream and former mindset. The Americans had chosen one route to sovereignty, independence, and the mercantile liberalism of pioneer expansionism. Canadians had chosen another and the choice would be inoculated with a blend of British Toryism, French ultramonté, and also loyalist sensibilities. Herein lies a vast demarcation between the pragmatism of the Tory worldview that accepts established realities. That would be the difference 
Tories would accept that, those established realities, whether it's culture or language, geography, and religion. Givens that are inherited and with which a city must accept and work. And the Whig view, the more liberal view, would be that of reason, optimism, and a positive purpose as a basis from which anything can be changed or improved. The Tory view that language, culture, and identity, and geography are to be respected as a vital to the way of Canada received and built. Now, Tories and Liberals always believe that in the advancement and preservation of full economic, social, and human rights, especially for new Canadians. However, from Yu's point of view, Tories differ from some Liberals by rejecting the notion that the Canadian identity can be whatever new arrivals choose to make it. The warm embrace of cultural diversity is very different from allowing the migration trends du jour to influence or force the renegotiation of our own core identity. Liberal nationalism tends to be exclusionary of realities on the ground, such as Quebec nationalism and Western pride. Often such liberal nationalism is expressed through new central government institutions, laws, pronouncements, making Ottawa and the central government the repository of our soul. The repository of what some called, and I was part of those debates, being responsible for the national interest. Well, you had a different experience. He had been chief of staff to Bill Davis in Ontario, and he had seen and experienced politics at the federal scene, and he knew that no single level of government was the single repository of the national interest. Hence, the Tories are often described as the British North America Act which implies regional and federal balances, and the Liberals are often described as the party of the Charter of Rights and Freedom, which implies, from the Liberal perspective, a more central view of the world. You also choose to do something that was interesting. He went back to what he describes as the Durham-Elgin divide. Now, if you've operated in Quebec politics, the Durham report is part of the mystic and the mystery and also the great taboos of Canadian politics. Lord Durham's report is viewed as the essential attempt of the British Empire to assimilate French Canadians and to mold them into a single culture and a single national identity. You returns to Lord Durham and he confronts Lord Durham to Earl Elgin, who by opposition would speak to Canadian demographic, geographic, and historical realities on the, on the grounds that it would define who we are. Interestingly enough, Lord Durham's report would not be implemented. Tories believe then in structure, in obligation, history, proven stability, sustainability as the pillars that form the institutions. And Tories believe that ideas society, life, and who we are as people and as a nation are sustained and nourished by these institutions. Macdonald Cartier, from his point of view, their partnership was the result and the symbol of the duality of our history to date, and would in fact become the political cornerstone of the blue Tory alliance that would Canada and form the basis of a multi-party coalition. You returned to a great quote from Sir John A. Macdonald about why he had accepted the compromise of the federal system as opposed to a central government, a quote that I used very often myself, and I even passed on, this will stay among, among us, to Stephen Harper in June of 2006, when the Parti Québécois and the Bloc were claiming and asking and demanding that Quebec be recognized as a nation and Yui quite rightfully pulls out this quote that I passed on to Mr. Harper. And I remember saying to Mr. Harper at the time, if the very first Prime Minister of Canada say this, why would you deny him? And what did he say? This was in response to a journalist 
Uh, the Montreal Gazette was asking him why he did the compromise. And MacDonald responds, treat them as a nation. And speaking to what was Quebec at the time, and they will act as a free people generally do, generously. Call them a faction, and they become factious. And so the rest is history. The French fact and its accommodation are at the core of the Canadian conservative mission and soul. And you reminded us of this. He also returned to the concept of nation and enterprise, which for him was excessive important. In the Canadian rebalancing of the traditional between free enterprise and private capital on one side versus public interest and social responsibility on the other, it is about a common interest conservatism as opposed to a special interest conservatism. Free enterprise, he, he would say, smilingly, I can imagine, for the poor in certain countries, and state finance socialism for the rich. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> this kind of balancing is something that he would call nation and enterprise. From the scenario routes of Canada, from the public borings for core infrastructure and national railway, from the role of the governors in enterprise and exploration under both the French and the English, this mix of public and private has been essential to the growth of Canada and its ongoing economic development. A national conservative party could be to the left of the liberals on income security, as was seemed to be the case on use strong, strong defense and promotion of uh, an IBA. We could be to the left on income security and assistance to farming communities, and yet more on the right on defense, on reducing waste in government, moderating taxes and foreign priorities that would be brought into balance. He also refers in his seminal book to Borden, who became the father of modern 20th century Canadian Tory nationalism and internationalism. He refers back to Bennett, who had sought a sea change in our national politics. In 1903, he acted to create the Canadian Radio Broadcasting Commission. Probably had in mind Madame Clarkson as a future star of that. Red Tory populism is what Diefenbaker brought to the evolution of conservatism. The populist, anti-establishment stance of the West grew in part out of immigration, not just immigration, you teaches us that comes from Europe, but also from the United States after the revolution in Western Canada that forms and shapes their view of the world and of their own country. Conservative populism would finally emerge to take over the Tory legacy and make it a more compelling political offering. And that would be the offering of the iconoclastic people's conservative John Diefenbaker. The specifics of Diefenbaker government initiatives are viewed in the context of stakeholders who brought about his rise to power, which was an increase in the, uh, increase in the pensions of our older Canadians, of his allowances, the Canadian Bill of Rights, and the creation of Agricultural Rehabilitation and Development Act, the arrangement of massive sales of wheat of wheat and other agricultural products to Eastern Europe and China, and even the opening of a de facto relations with the People's Republic of at the time. Now, Hugh Siegel didn't only speak to the great accomplishments of conservatism, he also spoke to its failures, and its particular failure inability since the events of Louis Riel to regain the confidence of French-speaking Canadians. And of course, he speaks glowingly of Stanfield, Clark, and Mulroney in the long way road to 1994, and how there, for them, their hierarchical, the federalism is not a hierarchical structure with Ottawa, with the provinces at the bottom and the feds at the top. There is a basic tenet to conservatism that seems that one's at the family table at the schoolrooms, laboratories, farmers' fields, small businesses, campus lecture halls, churches, 
mosques, temples and synagogues, voluntary community groups, hospital operating rooms and militia regiments are more important than what happens in Ottawa. He adds that the conservative spectrum is and always be much larger than the conservative party, or I should add his, their electoral successes. The balance for a balanced future is what he saw, Canadian and not American conservatism. He embraced and believes that we should embrace the reality of subsidiarity, or the simple notion that local communities should have decisions made by the level of democratic government closest to them geographically. In fact, our provinces and territories have fiscal and practical powers that are much more advanced than those under any other federal system, almost that of a quasi-sovereign state. We are the most decentralized federation in the world, except maybe for Belgium. No one knows how Belgium works. <laughs> but he points to one thing about our country. This system allowed Saskatchewan to experiment with Medicare. Quebec could experiment with its own daycare, its pension plan. British Columbia could deliver a carbon tax policy that would be among the first examples in the world of how this could work. This flexibility could allow us to do things that other countries could not. We do not generally seek to modest or restrain government from ideological purposes. We seek to restrain government because it's a better protector of local particularity, identity, and freedom of action. And so finally, you points out that our country will be littered with detours, wrong turns, setbacks, deep ditches. If the approach in Canada and of Canadian conservatism, uh, the kind we shaped, is not nurtured. He believed in compassionate Canadian conservatism to the point where he promoted almost single-handedly the concept of a universal basic income. It was a contrarian idea coming from a conservative, or seemed to be. But when you explained how this would allow us to eliminate the stigma of poverty and to elevate people, and allow us to do essentially what we need to do and create a society in which they can be themselves and realize themselves. Well, we've rapidly understood that this was a form of government that reflected basic conservative values. This remains among the unfinished projects of you, Siegel. And I can tell I won't name names, but I will tell you that there are those who believe in it and who are intend to pursue, and were convinced by you, and intend to pursue this, uh, this matter. In closing, I want to quote a few remarks I've read since you has left us, and that impressed me, because I want to finish on one of the most important things that he did in his life, apart from being a mentor to a high, very important number of people, and young people in particular. In a text written in the Globe and Mail following by John Ibbotson, there's a quote from Paul Martin who had named him to the Senate, who says, I don't know anyone who like you, Siegel. I wouldn't want to know anyone who didn't like <laughs> you, Siegel. The second quote is from Brian Mulroney. We've lost someone who represented the glue that keeps us together. Good humor, honesty, friendship, and the capacity to see good in other people including people of other political parties. That's the glue of Canada. That was you, Siegel. And the last quote is from a friend of his, Raymond, Father Raymond D'Souza, who writes in the National Post, and writes a very touching story of their extraordinary relationship. And he writes, many more, I hope, will remember that he had what few in any field possess, the gift of friendship. He was a genius at it and generous with it. Well, any of us who've had the privilege of crossing the path of you, Siegel, will today feel a deep sense of gratitude, Donna, for that friendship. 
Thank you. Uh, to begin with, and the reason for the hat is that they took a few bits out of my head several months ago. And my compliments. What Hugh represented, what was implied, he was decent. And that is in our political publics, which is profoundly lacking. Notwithstanding, it's migrating even here in Canada. Decency in our political leaders to seek out not necessarily compromise, but to appreciate and understand that value ontologic and they're calibrated towards the common good. And what I heard from you and Charlie before is the exemplar, including this individual right here, Tom Axworthy. So it's more or less a comment, but as I said, I applaud. I was, I was uh, commenting that, you know, maybe a lot of change has to do also with the so creation of social media and that seems to amplify voices of anger <coughs> and create anonymity that allows people to express themselves in ways that uh, in a civil society they would not have done before. What I lament is that we should not be fatalists about this that we need leaders who are going to push back. And pushing back doesn't mean denying that anger, by the way. The very, you know, and I've learned that the hard way often because it exists and it's for real. But leadership means transforming that into something constructive and not tolerating behavior that uh, we know is detrimental to our society. <coughs> Yeah, Mr. Charest, nice to see you again. Um, I wondered if you had, and Hugh would have had, any views on how, on the conservative resurgence now among young people in particular, whom you might have thought would be the last people to embrace conservatism. Well, the, the jury's out on how all of this will translate into an eventual election campaign. And we will see, I mean, there's maybe two years now before the next election campaign. Robert Bourassa used to say that six months in politics is an eternity, so we have four eternities in front of us. Thank God you is immortal, <laughs> and his voice will continue to, uh, so a, a lot will happen. In the case of young Canadians, it's an interesting, uh, I think, uh, perspective. What is it that is making them so anxious about their future? Housing, a sense that they've lost control over their lives and their ability to integrate. And, and leaders need to address that. And hopefully they'll find you know, the right answers. That, and, and about conservatives today, you in the book of Right Balance, he, he insists on describing the evolution of conservatism through R.B. Bennett, and through Bord Borden and Bennett and then Diefenbaker and then uh, we have the Stanfield, Clark, Mulroney uh, era and all the way to, he goes to Manning and to conservatism and Stephen Harper. And he's not at war with any of the factions. What he's trying to do in that description is describe to us how conservatism is evolving with its advantages and its faults, by the way, its failures. And, uh, and so the same question is there today. How will the next conservative behave? Where will he land? Where will and I think that's a question mark. I'll tell you why in particular we've yet to hear him on a number of policy initiatives. We know what he may be against, which is fine and at this point, but what will he be for? What will he offer Canadians in the next campaign will be, I think, the determining factor. Uh, 
Mr. Charest, you're the most admirable political figure in Canada, and you have been able to move your political agenda by changing labels, conservative, liberal. How have you tried that to yourself and to other people in the Conservative Party? Well, that, and that's a very, uh, it's a very good question. It was posed during the leadership race because I was accused of being a liberal by people who either very deliberately ignored the extraordinary circumstances in which I moved from federal to provincial politics. And I, I just, I'll share an anecdote about that. You know, when I went to the Liberal Party of Quebec, the number one issue we were facing in the campaign is the fact that Lucien Bouchard wanted to hold a third referendum. That was the plan. And we came out of the referendum of 95, the whole country of us weakened. The last thing that, that we heard was another referendum and the risks. And I campaigned, I, during that campaign, it went very badly for me because the Quebec political environment is totally there. It's like being on planet Mars. But in the last 14 days of the campaign, Mrs. Clarkson, I campaigned on one single theme. After Lucien Bouchard made a statement, he said, c'est pas mes affaires de fonctionner le fédéralisme. It's not my business to make the federal system work. And so I instructed my campaign team, we're going to campaign on one single issue. No referendum. Two words in English, three words in French. Pas de référent. It's the only words that came out of my mouth for the last 14 days. On election night, Lucien Bouchard won a majority of the seats, but the Liberal Party of Quebec won a plurality of the votes, to everyone's surprise. And the referendum, Lucien tells the story, was out the window that night. The most important election campaign I fought in my life wasn't the one I won. It's the one I lost, which says a lot about life. I want to tell you, you know, in all honesty, I've always been a fiscal conservative. Even when I was the liberal leader in Quebec, the French press would describe me as Attila the Hun, Mike Harris of Quebec, and uh, <coughs> Le Vin Froid, you know. I've have always been a fiscal, and, but on social policy, I am more liberal. And I think there is a plurality of Indians who are feel that way, and who are homeless politically, feel homeless today. And that's where I am. And that's why the transition of the Liberal Party worked out very well. To the point, I'll tell you how well it was that I was a fiscal conservative. When Legault gets elected after 15 years of Liberal government, including Mr. Couillard, he's left with an $8 billion surplus. So I'm sorry, this is about you, Siegel, right? <laughs> well, you, Siegel, is about that. What I've just described to you as being a fiscal conservative that reflects very much where you would be. And so, and so that, that explains part of the, uh, I guess, the transition from one place to the other. And the great privilege I've had of serving my country. And by the way, in that race that we had a year ago, you supported me. So did Donna. And, uh, and it reminds me of another thing he said about winning or losing races. Uh, this is an interview he gave with Steve Bacon. He said, you know, whatever you do, the people are always right. Sometimes excessive. <laughs> Which I agree with. <laughs> but in the end, they're always, uh, they're always right. Thank you very, very much for listening to me. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call Tina Park to come up and to thank our keynote. Uh, Tina uh, is the CEO of the Tina Park Group, Vice President of the, uh, of the NATO Association of Canada. Both are co-sponsors with Massey College of this event. Uh, she's been a junior fellow at Massey, teaches at Monk, and is one of the foremost uh, experts on North Asia in Canada. Tina Park. Well, on behalf of Massey College, the Park Group, and the NATO Association of Canada, I'd like to thank Mr. Charay for an exceptionally insightful uh, remarks you shared with us today, and also for the deeply personal uh, remarks that, that you've shared on uh, Hugh Siegel, whom all, uh, we all miss uh, very much today.
I'd like to now call upon the first panel on uh, social domestic impact to come to the uh, front, uh, Professor Tui, uh, Bill Fox, and Keith Fanting. Thanks very much. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to uh, introduce